This is part two in a series on truth. When I finished last night, I just realized that I, I needed to elucidate on a, a few issues. First, let me say this. The most important issue of our day is that of truth. There's a lot of other issues, but that's that's the bottom line. You know, we've all heard of the notion of the generation gap, right? Well, in our case, it would be more accurate to speak of a truth gap. Perhaps an epistemology gap, but it boils down to a truth gap, a difference between the generations in the understanding of the nature of truth. With one, within one or two generations, the entire basic nature of truth has undergone a radical change, making things like the difference in the taste of music, like Elvis or Hendrix, the music between the older and the younger generations seem inconsequential in comparison. Even back in the 60s, though, the new truth was beginning to be espoused by the hippie generation. In fact, we may call that time the second American Revolution. That's how profound it was. And I lived through it. But the roots of the change in truth go further back than the hippies. That's, but that's when it, it started changing in earnest. What is the biblical definition of truth? Well, the way I would put it is that truth is that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God, because God's perception of reality is perfect and not distorted. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God, because his perception of reality is perfect, exhaustive, and not distorted. As I mentioned, this is part two, and I wanted to clarify the meaning of and the contrast between these two notions of truth. Specifically, what do we mean when we say that the biblical concept of truth is that it is both absolute and objective versus relative and subjective? I know I touched on this, but that's the main thing that I don't think I talked enough, enough about. When we say that truth is objective, we mean that it originates and lies outside of us. Okay? The objectivity of truth means that it's outside of us. First and foremost, the objectiveness of truth means that it originates in the character of God. And then in the propositional revelation of God, which is in God's permanent record, is found in as found in sacred scripture. And this is sometimes called the inscripturated word, with Jesus as being the incarnate word. The objective nature of truth accents that it is true apart from human feelings, opinions, or reasoning. This key point: its source it is truth. Its source is from God. God's truth corresponds to reality as he perceives it, as I said. But the key point is that saying that truth is objective means that it is it lies outside of us, the um, origin and nature of it, essentially um, in the character of God and then revealed in his word. In contrast, to say that truth is subjective is to say that truth originates in us. Okay, It is derived from our feelings, our preferences, and our opinions. Truth is inside. All right? So autonomous intuitions, feelings, reason, etc., is a source of truth. Its source is from man instead of being from God. To say that truth is absolute 
is to accent the universal binding nature of God's truth. As our Creator and Lord, He has the authority to elicit absolute obligation from us. It is true whether anybody believes it or not. God is so really true in there, the the living God. If nobody believed in God, He would still exist. It is true across all cultures. It is true across all times. This perspective on truth accents <clears throat> that true truth, it was Francis Schaeffer talk, talking about what objective truth, is true for all people at all times and all cultures. It is rooted in the unchanging character of God. It is unchanged and unchanging. Try to picture this. Picture truth is deeply engraved in granite. It is true truth. Truth that is really true. It's rational. And as I said, the absoluteness emphasizes the fact that it is true for everyone equally. So, um, the dictionary definition of relative truth is based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. Let me say it again. Relative truth is based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. The effect of this is that truth varies from one person to the next. A host of personal factors may cause a certain belief to be true for one person but not true for another, but the primary point is that it changes from one person to the next. Relative truth changes constantly. There is no belief which is necessarily true for all people. As opposed to being deeply engraved in granite, subjective truth is like figures drawn in the sand on the beach. With each successive wave, it is wiped out and changes. This truth embraces contradictory assertions or propositions as being equally true, meaning that at its heart, it is irrational. You know, to illustrate the difference between the two, I want to read the same text that I read from last night, Le- Le- Leviticus 4. Keep in mind the two conce- as I read it, keep in mind the two conceptions of truth as we read this text. And I would encourage you to, to read it on your own. Um, I was in college when I was first struck with the truth of what I'm about to share with you. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I can, I can actually remember where I was when this thought was going through my head, I said, wow, that is profound, what it says about the nature of truth. And um, it made a deep impression on me, obviously. So note how many contingencies there, there, there are that would seem to make their offenses to be non-offensive. That is, if someone were had a subjective view of truth, boy, this it would seem the, the, the scenario played out here, if anyone had a case, so to speak, for, uh, I guess, saying that um, they didn't know better, these folks did. But just, I don't know, I, I don't know of a text that reveals the sheer objectivity and absoluteness of God's truth or law. Uh, better than this one. So let me, uh, let's read Leviticus 4, verse 13 and following. Listen carefully, please. If the whole, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandment ought not to be done, and they realize their guilt when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull 
from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front in front of the tent of meeting. Okay. Just by way of introduction to Leviticus, it was written just from within a few months of the Exodus and was written to inform God's people on how they should approach and worship their holy God who was in their midst in that particular era of redemption, redemptive history. Second, you know, it really does sadden me. It's kind of getting off topic a little but It saddens me that so many people don't read God's law because they've been told that it's no longer instructive or binding in any way, which is actually contrary to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's an issue for another day. All right, now, I, I, I hope you open your Bibles so you can see this for yourself. First note this, that the act in question is called unintentional. What Moses is doing is he's laying out like case law and stuff like that, um, anticipating this, that, and the other, uh, and what a godly response should be, what God expects from his holy people. But note that the act in question is called unintentional. All right? No malice of forethought. Right? No thought at all. Nothing was done as an intentional act of rebellion. They didn't even know that they'd done anything wrong. And in addition, they were sincere. Two. Or secondly, the entire congregation does it unintentionally. Moses is writing about a situation in which the entire nation the entire country, every single man, woman, and child has done something of which nobody has any awareness that it is wrong. It's unintentional, it's universal, but think about a situation like that. You got a couple million people, as I understand it. Every single one of them has done something. Surely you can't be wrong. It's unintentional, and everybody's done it, and they don't think they've done anything wrong. But further, it's clarified that it's hidden from their eyes. I guess that's another way of saying unintentional, but it's just accenting that. Picture this, if you would. You're talking about an entire country that's done something unintentionally without knowing it was wrong. That is, in their eyes, they sincerely believe they have all believed and done rightly. Now, if ever there was a situation in which, for argument's sake, operating under relativistic and subjective standards these folks should have been in the clear. I mean, they should have been right. That was it. If truth can vary from individual to individual, how about if a whole dang country agrees that it's right? It's sincere. You must be right, right? No, nah, wrong. We're not talking about one or two people, man. Like I said, we're talking about an entire nation believing sincerely they are doing right. But notice what they have done. The text says they have done something contrary to what? God's suggestions? They've done something contrary to God's commandments. There we see the objective and absolute nature of God's truth. These aren't suggestions. These are commandments. As I said, God is not a democratic ruler. He is a benevolent dictator. So they do something contrary not only to God's law, but it ought not to be done. It's wrong. God decides oughtness, not us. 
they discover by some means that they are guilty, right, of doing some sin. Note that they are guilty before they come to that awareness, though. The guilt doesn't come afterwards. It comes, they were guilty before they were aware of anything of doing it wrong. That's how objective, that's how absolute truth is. We're guilty whether we feel guilty or not, if it's against God's word. But when they discover their sin and consequent guilt, they are to deal with it immediately in the way God prescribes. If any situation would seem to give these people the right to be right in their wrongness, this is it. But here we see the utter and sheer objectivity and absoluteness of God's truth. Though the entire country has done something which they do not even know is wrong, but is said to be wrong in God's objective word, then they are morally culpable before these absolutes, these objective absolute truth. Nothing in the Bible shows more clearly the absolute and objective nature of truth than this text, in my opinion. And it squash, squashes all the reasons people give, like, sincerity. You know, y'all, since truth exists, then it is possible to be sincere, but sincerely wrong. Many people are sincere, but sincerely wrong. Let me switch gears. You know, everyone has an ultimate criterion. Hopefully that helped. Everyone has an ultimate criterion by which they determine truth regarding what is right and wrong. What God is like, what reality is like, how we get to heaven, if there is a heaven, and so on. Everyone has some presupposition, some criterion, which they may or may not be conscious of. It either, um, now this is crucial, it either lies outside of us in God's word and is objective and absolute, or they see their criterion as their own autonomous reason, intuition, feelings, preference, experience, etc. And truth ends up becoming subjective and relative. All of the non-Christian presuppositions lead to incoherence because they violate the law of non-contradiction. So, when discussing with a non-Christian, it is vital to bring up what their criterion is. Since so everybody has a criterion they lean on to determine how they acquire knowledge about the paranormal realm, about the nature of God, nature of truth in any area. And we need to bring that out in people and to realize Help them, see that, help them to realize that their ultimate criterion or presupposition, help them see what it is and how it leads to absurdity. You know, when Aristotle wrote about the laws of logic, he called logic the necessary tool for learning or communication. He didn't invent logic. He discovered the laws which God himself had implanted within our brains to think rationally as God thinks rationally. Logic is not merely a tool, though it's a very important one, to determine if propositions are true. It is that. We spoke of the law of non-contradiction, which is vital for all meaningful communication. If you think about it just for a minute, if you start vi violating the law of non-contradiction, and, and if you're consistent with that, all meaningful communication would, uh, would cease. Even those who deny the validity of the law of non-contradiction have to live as if it were true because they live in God's world in which it is necessary to survive to make distinctions. In fact, everyone has to live, live as if Christianity were true in order to survive and function in this world God has made. 
I wish they had time to elucidate that more because there's a lot of fascinating, helpful insights in that. For example, that red light cannot be red and green at the same time. But folks become very selective in their belief in the law of non-contradiction. You know, it states that A cannot be non-A at the same time, same relationship. They can become very selective when it comes to science, they believe it, but when it comes to religion, they don't. Ever, ever seen any of those YouTube videos of young people being interviewed about their religious beliefs? It's awful, because most of them violate this basic law of logic when they assert that if only they are sincere, then they have a right to believe whatever they want. But it is true for them, but it's not true for others. That's not how God operates, as we saw in Leviticus 4. Wrong beliefs may not get you in prison in America or England, but they will send you to hell for eternity. What happened to logic? Why in, is, in this generation have we embraced irrationality? You know, it's so frustrating to talk to people who, who don't even believe that truth is truth. How did we get to where we are? And that's one of the things that has been a passion of mine is the flow of ideas and specifically how do we get to the place where we are because ideas trickle down over a period of time. Can I give you a quick lesson in philosophy? There were many contributing factors which came together as a confluence that brought about the current views of truth. But let me mention one guy, George Hegel, uh, who lived uh, a couple hundred years ago, who had an incredibly massive influence on this whole idea of um, the change in truth. Even though it was 200 years ago, it bounced around and in various forms that finally found its way out into the street and um, it's like a juggernaut in our culture. Now try, put on your thinking caps, all right? Think of the basic way of, of how we think. We think in terms of the law of non-contradiction, right? A cannot be non-A, right? So, the, this chair I'm sitting in can't be a chair and not a chair at the same time. Uh, you insert the word, instead of A, non A, thesis versus uh, antithesis. Um, thesis would be just a, a statement versus antithesis. The antithesis would be the opposite of that thesis, okay? That's how Aristotle um, I mean, that's how we talk. We talk about something and then it's opposite. Okay, that's the law of non-contradiction. Thesis versus antithesis. That's just another way of talking about the law of non-contradiction. That's something that we assume in everyday life. Now, what I'm about to, to show you is how that whole idea, as basic as it is, got tossed into the wind. Okay, you got thesis versus antithesis as far as our understanding of truth. Follow me? Again, this is not just Aristotle, but he was the one who formulated the, the rules. Okay, A cannot be, it's the opposite. A cannot be non-A, as I said. All right, Hegel proposed a radical new view of truth or knowledge. Instead of viewing something and its opposite, the thesis and its antithesis, what he suggested as a novel way of acquiring truth and knowledge is to take the thesis 
And instead of seeing it in, in opposition to the antithesis, he said, oh, why don't we just add it to the opposite? Let's take the thesis, let's take the antithesis, join them together for a nice synthesis. That equals truth and knowledge. I sure hope you're following me there. You got a thesis, some statement, you got its opposite. How do we acquire true knowledge or just truth? You take something and you take its opposite, the thesis and the antithesis, and you synthesize them. You bring them together and voila, you have truth. You have contradictory truth. This massive, this was a watershed moment in the history of mankind. It truly was. Um, this idea that Hegel taught was discussed in academia, of course, a couple hundred years ago. It eventually got spread into different th other thinkers who spread it into existentialism and so forth, it morphed into other variations of what he was saying, including theological neo-orthodoxy, which is very popular in the mid 20th century with Karl Barth, Bruner, and other guys. And listen to this, because this, this comes right out of Hegel. And we're talking about alleged Christian theologians. I don't think they are Christians, but they said that the hallmark, not just a hallmark or a characteristic, but the hallmark of truth is contradiction. And these are alleged Christian theologians saying that the hallmark of truth is contradiction. But that's, just, that's exactly what Hegel was driving at, was that the hallmark of knowledge or truth is bringing the two contradictory comments uh, comments together for a synthesis. It, it's really a demonic, um, chaotic view of truth and knowledge. Something that which was at first totally academic, the way it usually happens, is it's discussed in academia, the kids go to the colleges, okay, where the academics are. They get taught it. They embrace it. Then it starts to get, you know, passed and spread across the culture, music, films, so forth. So do you see how this relates to where we are today? where the belief in opposites does not pose a problem for our youth. Truth as objective, absolute, non-contradictory facts has been replaced by satanic logic of the garden in which he contradicted God. And if this aspect of God's image of Godness, thinking in logical categories, has been replaced by um, demonic irrationality, that is chaos in the mind. We should weep. Uh, many people began to view faith. This is just another building on top of Hegel. Is some of the followers of Kierkegaard began to view faith as an irrational leap of faith contrary to logic. So you have... Um, to the extent that uh, Kierkegaard was uh, influenced by Hegel and so forth, they, or the two combined, um, you just have this ir irrationality um, which has led to the um, st state that we're in now. So when I finished my first segment on truth, I was overwhelmed by the situation we face. It really was. I got to thinking about how in the world do we change? Um, 
you got the vast majority of the young people believing in this demonic notion of truth. And probably most of the um, middle-aged people as well, I would think it's, it's really mostly the elderly folks. When I'm talking elderly, I'm talking about 70s and 80s, who, who are the ones who have the clear conception of the old view of truth. But for my generation down, um, we're the ones who have, this is what, this is what we were um, brought up on is this um, whole new conception of truth. And I didn't want to just leave it the way I did last night because I almost, it almost seemed like hopeless. Like, what, what do we do in light of this juggernaut that has, um, is just crushing our, our country and uh, the West? Well, um it's uh and most of us have family who are in this boat regarding truth so it's very personal what can we possibly do in light of this juggernaut i'm gonna say a couple of things and by way of closing um as you read your word and i hope and pray that you do read your your bible regularly is that a continual reading of God's word will confirm in your mind the categories of absolute truth. Just line after line, line after line, precept after precept. As you read it day in and out, it just will confirm in your mind the, the, this nature of absolute truth and um, help you to live it out in your own life in a way that the Holy Spirit guides you. But the second thing I would say, because I don't want to leave people feeling guilty that they can't do more, because I'm not sure what else I can do other than do this video, um, other than what I'm about to tell you. The second thing is in the massive reversal can only start within families, which entails teaching our children about the nature of truth and how the Bible teaches that truth is objective, that it is absolute, and then also prepare them for the world's understanding of truth and why it's wrong, why it cannot be true. That's the place to start, y'all. Um, and I would uh, say in conclusion that we... Uh, we also need to pray for both revival and reformation. We need both. We do. Heavenly Father, we do pray for revival and reformation. From a human perspective, it seems hopeless because of how entrenched our culture is and in this demonic lie of the nature of truth. Help us in our own spheres of influence to um, mirror to the world your holiness and love and the nature of truth. For Jesus' sake, amen.